In December 1907, President Theodore Roosevelt sent 16 battleships and support ships to circumnavigate the globe. They were painted in gleaming peacetime white and became known as the Great White Fleet. It was frankly a demonstration of American sea power, a warning to foes, an encouragement to friends. From Tokyo Bay to Gibraltar, crowds flocked to see the first projection of America's forces on the world stage. For the 14,000 sailors, it was the adventure of a lifetime. They saw the proposed naval base at Pearl Harbor, then nothing but a bay surrounded by cane fields. They beheld the crowds in Sydney, Australia, roused over a perceived threat from Asia, carrying signs that read, down with the yellow peril, and worse. Coal, of course, was the fuel. The few colliers the Navy possessed were entirely inadequate, and the required fuel was furnished for the most part by means of British tramp steamers. This was a lesson, for under war conditions with the neutral Britain, our fleet would have been practically immobile. When Theodore Roosevelt sent the Great White Fleet around the world 110 years ago, he did it as a show of the Navy's strength and our ability to project that strength, to be present. He understood how important it was for the rest of the world to see the U.S. Navy paving the way forward for our country. The Navy has always been a leader when it comes to energy innovation sail to coal in the middle of the 19th century, coal to oil in the early 20th century, pioneering the use of nuclear in the middle of the 20th century. And every single time, every single time there were naysayers. You can't do this. You're trading one thing that's free, the wind, for something that costs you money, coal. You're trading all these coaling stations around the world for an unproven source of fuel, oil. You will never make nuclear power small enough or safe enough to put on a submarine or a carrier. And every single time, every single time they were dead wrong. This fuel cost the American taxpayer, cost U.S. government, two dollars and five cents a gallon. Now, a lot was made in 2012 when we demonstrated Great Green Fleet of the cost of the fuel. Well, yeah, we bought a very small amount. It was a demonstration. The world didn't stop in 2012. We paid $26 a gallon then we're paying 13 times less today, just three and a half years later. That's the story. That's the success. $2.05 a gallon. Real return on uh, these uh, energy saving, uh, energy conservation measures, use of biofuel, etc., is the return in war fighting capability or mission capability. It's the ability to go further, to stay longer and to have more capability when you get there. So by uh, not having to use, in the Macon Island or the America case, 50% uh, less, less fuel allows you to take that um, marine group wherever you need to go for an amphibious objective area and stay there much longer without having to worry about going back to the oiler every uh, so often. A new era arrived, the era of atomic propulsion. Range, power, less dependence on friendly refueling conditions. These are issues that led to the nuclear fleet in the 1950s and led to the transition from coal to oil. Every ship that transitioned to oil was faster, carried more armament, and had a longer range. And so the fleets transitioned from steam. 
the first one seeking tactical advantage, the rest seeking to avoid obliteration. But the navies and governments have been in a degree of crisis over supply and the balance of power ever since. Two members of the delegation going out to Persia for talks on the oil crisis, Mr. Jackson and Mr. Elkington, are seen about to leave London Airport. Mr. Jackson, Deputy Chairman of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. By 1913, the British First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, had seen enough of German naval expansion. He accelerated the conversion of the British fleet from coal to oil, which would allow his ships to operate longer and carry more of their weight in armaments instead of fuel. He set out to find a sustainable source of the new energy, and he found it in the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. Under Churchill's direction, Britain took a controlling stake in the venture and signed a 20-year contract for a supply of oil. The company would be renamed British Petroleum in 1954 and today is known the world over as BP. Out of the First World War, a red line agreement was drawn up for the Middle East, separating British interests in Persia from United States and French influence to the West. U.S. energy companies were restricted to exploration near the Persian Gulf where no reliable source of oil had yet been discovered. But when they found petroleum near Bahrain in the 1930s, it was the greatest oil strike in history. It made Saudi Arabia rich beyond its wildest dreams through the formation of the world's largest company, Saudi Aramco. And it led directly to the founding of the OPEC oil cartel. In the Americas, a young Franklin Roosevelt, serving as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, set out after the end of the war to secure a long-term supply of oil for the United States. Vast reserves of petroleum on federal lands were set aside for the Navy's future needs. Elk Hills, Anvil Points, and land in Wyoming known as Teapot Dome. There would be a seesaw over leasing rights that landed Secretary of the Interior Albert Fall in prison, and the debate would last until the 1990s when the reserves were mostly privatized. The decision left the Navy without a long-term energy reserve. Meanwhile, U.S. naval operations and readiness have not been as keenly tested in decades. The causes? Ongoing tensions in the Middle East severe disruptions in Mediterranean economic and political stability, waves of immigration across both land and water, and most importantly, disputes arising over sovereignty in the South China Sea. An investigation by, by the Philippine military has shown that Chinese leaders are busy staking their claim in disputed waters. War of words over potential U.S. actions in the South China Sea is heating up. It's the first time any legal challenge has been brought in the South China Sea territorial dispute. <laughs> 红方舰艇编队迅速采取反抗 U.S. Chief of Naval Operations John Richardson said that U.S. military forces will continue to operate in the South China Sea in accordance with international law. Secretary of State John Kerry said last week in his address to the National Defense University, the United States will remain more engaged in more places in the world than in any other time in history. The Navy and Marine Corps uniquely provide presence around the world, around the clock, ensuring stability, deterring adversaries, giving our leaders options in times of crisis. The Navy is currently projecting quite a bit of presence, in part because the U.S. government's response to China's expansion has been unambiguous. We want a peaceful resolution of all disputes and an immediate and lasting halt to land reclamation by any claimant. We also oppose any further militarization of disputed features. Second, and there should be no mistake, there should be no mistake about this, the United States will fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. 
as we do all around the world. China's response, peaceful in its public diplomacy, but its military buildup continues. Uh, the U.S. Uh, defense budget is being cut every year. China's military budget is increasing by at least 12 percent annually. And in terms of uh, both the quantity of arms and the quality of arms, China is rapidly catching up with the United States. To highlight their technological progress, China released this promotional video on its naval capability. What's the dispute in the South China Sea all about? For the future, it's about resources, oil, natural gas, fishing. As Tomo News reports, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Brunei have conflicting claims, but China claims the entire sea as sovereign territory. For today, it's about trade. As this graphic from EIA shows, a huge portion of the world's energy trade flows from the Middle East to the South China Sea. This is the route for China's major trading partners, and that's where the U.S. has key peacekeeping deployments. At stake, perhaps the future of world trade, with 34% of the world's GDP now represented by Asia. To meet its operational goals, the Navy developed a strategy based on more fight, less fuel. More options, less risk. More capability, less cost. One of the routes chosen was a focus on cooperation with partners and allies, including the development of energy efficiency technology and the deployment of alternative fuels. In July 2016, the Rim of the Pacific Maritime Exercises commenced out of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii the largest naval exercise in the world, held every two years, promoting goodwill and naval cooperation. This year, 25,000 sailors, 45 ships, and 26 countries are taking part. Among those sending the most ships, the United States and China. It's a hopeful sign. In addition, seven top executives from the alternative fuel industry attended RIMPAC, Let's travel with them and towards a sustainable refueling at sea. First, we head for the amphibious assault ship USS America for a demonstration of hybrid energy drives. The craft we're traveling on is an Osprey. It's a tilt rotor aircraft that takes off and lands like a helicopter and flies like a plane. We'll travel from Pearl Harbor to the USS America, which is its station somewhere off the coast of Hawaii's Big Island. And while we're on route, Chris Tyndall, the Director of Operational Energy from the U.S. Navy, will tell us a little bit more about the Great Green Fleet. So, when, in this case, the Carrier Strike Group, the, uh, the John C. Stennis uh, Carrier Strike Group, uh, deployed from San Diego uh, January 20th. It had uh, three different destroyers uh, with it, and they're all operating on alternative fuels, and they have energy conservation measures. Uh, the 2016 Great Green Fleet is really a year-long event. So in, back in 2012, it was just really two or three days, as long, however long the fuel lasted. You did a certification event, or was it, a, was it to demonstrate that it would work, or was that, that was a test? To, that was actually to demonstrate. It was at the end of the testing period, where we had already tested all the ships in the aircraft. But now we were, we were testing it in an operational environment. During the Rim of the Pacific exercise, an international uh, event, is where we actually were using that. And at the same time, we actually had uh, a Royal Australian Navy helicopter come over and, and get a drink of the, of the jet fuel that we were using. This week, the USS America might as well be called the USS United Nations because crews from other nations are embedded with U.S. forces here. From a Kiwi lilt to an Asian accent, the sense of multi-nation partnership is not hard to find. Now, we'll take the USS America to the Korean destroyer Sejong the Great, 
operating somewhere near the big island of Hawaii, where the refueling will take place. This is not the first rim pack with an alternative fuels component, as the Navy's Chris Tyndall explains. In 2012, we did a demonstration of the Great, uh, great Green Fleet, and that was basically where we were using alternative fuels, but then also had energy conservation measures too. The green part is only because of the moniker back to, back to the Great White Fleet. We don't want to say necessarily that we're doing things to be green. We're doing it mainly for energy security across the board. And now our ride gets choppier and closer to the water's surface and the noise from the downdraft picks up substantially as we approach the Korean guided missile destroyer which will be shortly refueling at sea. Much of the world's oil supply is controlled by states, regimes, and a cartel for which America's well-being is not exactly a priority. We must shift our entire energy economy toward new and cleaner power sources, such as wind, solar, biofuels. It will include a variety of new automotive and fuel technologies, clean-burning coal, and nuclear energy. The next president must be willing to break with the energy policies, not just to the current... Sustainable, affordable, available. With fuel, in the past, you could usually get two out of the three. It was either unaffordable or unavailable. And if you could find it and afford it, it wasn't sustainable. More than one U.S. president has foundered in search of a sustainable alternative to oil. I spoke to you earlier. I indicated that the sudden cutoff of oil from the Middle East had turned the serious energy shortages we expected this winter into a major energy crisis. That crisis is now being felt around the world, as other industrialized nations have also suffered from cutbacks in oil from the Middle East. This, the amount of gasoline which refiners distribute to wholesalers and retailers will be reduced across the nation by 15%. Last January 15th, I went before your senators and representatives in Congress with a comprehensive plan to make our country independent of foreign sources of energy by 1985. I am tonight setting a clear goal for the energy policy of the United States. Beginning this moment, this nation will never use more foreign oil than we did in 1977. Never. From now on, every new addition to our demand for energy will be met from our own production and our own conservation. The generation long growth in our dependence on foreign oil will be stopped dead in its tracks right now. America is addicted to oil, which is often imported from unstable parts of the world. The best way to break this addiction is through technology. Since 2001, we have spent nearly $10 billion to develop cleaner, cheaper, and more reliable alternative energy sources. And we are on the threshold of incredible advances. Breaking news now, an Iranian commander has come out and threatened to block the United States from the Strait of Hormuz. Yes, huge story right now. The Associated Press is reporting that the... Here on Sejong the Great, we're met by Commodore Lee of the South Korean Navy and his crew. He'll take us on a tour of the control room and then on to the deck for the refueling. The oiler is close. What makes refueling at sea a dicey proposition is that ships running at 13 knots in close proximity tend to draw together. It's called the Casimir effect and we have to watch out for it. Next, crew fire a bow shot and secure the lines between the ships. 
And now the refueling line is advanced across the water while the ships maintain their 13 knot speeds. This blend includes 10% alternative fuels. The Navy at present will allow up to 50% blends and you'd think that the hardest thing would be sourcing the affordable alternative fuel. Actually, it's finding a petroleum partner willing to supply the conventional fuel component. One of the reasons we have a 10% blend right now. There'll be more later. This fuel is supplied by Alt Air, 77 million gallons in all, in a $160 million cost competitive contract. In fact, it's far less than the Navy paid for conventional fuels just three years ago. In the United States, there's been just one practical and successful effort to date to deploy drop-in alternative fuels at scale for military energy security, and that's the Navy program, which has now drawn in eight allies in a combined effort to use expanded fuel options and to evade the consequences of supply disruption or price volatility. We're complete with refueling and it's on to the USS Chung Hoon for a demonstration of energy conservation measures. Even the lighting matters on a ship because 40% of the fuel on board is used to provide electricity and every watt saved goes to the mission. So now we're back to Pearl via helicopter leaving the Aegis destroyers like the Chung Hoon and the Sejong the Great. In all, nine nations used alternative fuels in operations, including Australia, South Korea, Canada, Chile, Japan, and Singapore. It's technology that adds diversity in fuel supply, and it's worth noting that fast-growing Asia has few proven oil reserves and is home to more biomass than any other continent. It's an opportunity for the fleets to simplify their logistics making fuels right at their primary port instead of importing across trade routes which are getting hot and crowded. Operating longer and more independently, that's one lesson of the RIMPAC exercises. But perhaps even more, it's the cooperation of allies. As Vice Admiral Nora Tyson commanding the U.S. Third Fleet and RIMPAC itself said, the maritime environment is too large for any one nation to protect. And as Commander Tom Ogden, skipper of the Chung Hoon, observed, if I can get to know the captain of another ship and we find ourselves on two sides of a misunderstanding, then we have that much better an opportunity to find a resolution. So having China and the United States operating in harmony on a naval exercise in this way at this time, that's a good thing to pair with sustainable fuels on troubled waters. This may be the most formal ceremony I've ever attended to celebrate everyday operations. That's exactly the point. We're just deploying the Great Green Fleet. The Stockdale, the ship you see behind me, the Stennis that left a few minutes ago, and those will, that deploy with her won't look any different from any other carrier strike group. 